Well, Rembrandt made several group portraits, four that we are sure of, four institutional group portraits. Not this one, it's by Van der Helst, as you will have seen in the exhibition, and not even this one. At least this is not an official group portrait. It's a fragment of a much larger painting the artist produced in his later years for the decoration of the Amsterdam Town Hall, but which was removed and cut in size not long after it had been installed. This large fragment is now in Stockholm. The painting depicts a crucial episode from, from the conspiracy of the Batavians, let's call them early Dutch tribes, against the Romans around 70 AD. It was told to us by Tacitus. He wrote that the one-eyed Claudius Civilis, quote, collected at one of the sacred groves, ostensibly for a banquet, the chiefs of the nation and the boldest spirits of the lower class, unquote. Convinced them to join his rebellion and swear an oath on it. That's what we see happening here. The reason I am showing you this group is because it exemplifies how a historical, biblical, or mythological event should be visualized, focusing on a turning point in the story. What we are looking at is the dramatic moment the Batavians swear the oath to Commander-in-Chief Claudius Civilis to start their revolt. As you can imagine, this heroic subject matter was perfect for a painting in a new town hall of Amsterdam, the most powerful city in the Dutch Republic, after the successful struggle for independence from Spanish rule. But let's face it, this is not a portrait, but a history painting of a group gathered around a table. The only face that might have mattered here as a would-be likeness is that of the one-eyed Claudius. Another of these groups is this one, an early painting by Rembrandt. Again, we see a table as the focal point in the composition, but in this case, much more emphasis is on the individual likenesses. After all, the people depicted had to pay for their own portrait, with the logical exception of the man whose corpse is on the table. So the situation is fundamentally different to that of the Batavians swearing their oath. What I hope to clarify in this talk is how Rembrandt made cleverly use of the principles of history painting with the aim to add life and drama to his group portraits. In order to make my point, I'll show you a few cases of mutual influence between painters and their increasing strive for interaction and narrative. The Dutch group portrait shows a highly varied spectrum, as you can see in this image. The depiction of several persons in a composition confronted the painters not only with the limitations of the painted space, but also with the various wishes and demands of their clients. Someone paying for his own portrait desired a good likeness, preferably in three-quarter profile. It was up to the artist to devise acceptable solutions. And whereas a modern audience will judge a portrait like this on its liveliness and the interaction between the sitter and the onlooker, to the client in the 17th century, the most relevant aspect was most probably the resemblance of the sitter combined with proper use of hierarchy and decorum. First, Let's have a look at the Civic Guard group portrait, that manifesto of male bonding for the upper middle class and the elite. Originally, the medieval militias were organized as religious brotherhoods and divided into squads. But in 1580, following the first decade of the 80 years war as part of the Dutch struggle for independence from Spanish rule, they were reorganized as Civic Guards installed and controlled by the city government. The officer corps was recruited from members of the urban elite, the highest in command being the colonel. Between 1620 and 1650, the three Amsterdam civic guard houses, or doelens as they are called, comprised of 20 companies, each one under the leadership of a captain, 
a lieutenant and two sergeants. Each company was responsible for public order and safety in its own precinct of the city. Members of the Civic Guard, or should I call it the Neighborhood Watch, had to pay for their own uniform and arms, herewith keeping the lower classes out of the organization. And for the male elite, a function as an officer in the Civic Guard formed an integral part of their civic career. Over the years, the walls of the Doolans were adorned with paintings depicting squads and companies of Civic Guards. Not everybody was able to participate as the companies were too large to have all men portrayed. So there must have been a selection procedure. Sadly, we don't know the details of this process. But we do know that always the highest ranking officers had to be present. They can be recognized by their ceremonial arms. A short pike staff for the captain on the, the, the blue oval on the left. A partisan for the lieutenant, the partisan is indicated in the yellow oval, and the halberd for the sergeants in red, and the company's banner for the ensign or standard bearer in the middle. And when preparing a civic guard group portrait, there were several options for the painter. The men perfectly lined up, ready to act together in a meeting or at the festive banquet. The choice was related to local traditions and trends. Especially in Haarlem and Amsterdam, a huge demand for these paintings prompted highly original solutions. And I stick to Amsterdam examples here. At first, the genre of the militia group portrait only existed in Amsterdam. In 1533, Cornelis Antonius portrayed 17 members of a squad on one panel, using a simple banquet table as the center of his composition. Following the reorganization of the militia guilds in 1580, a different composition scheme came into being showing the officers as well as other guardsmen in full length with, in many cases, the arms they carry referring to their rank in the group. This imposing work by 1588 by Cornelis Ketel, which was, was praised in 1604 by the biographer Karl van Mander for its lifeliness and elegance, marks the start of a period of great flourishing of the civic guard portrait. Frans Badens, present in our show, clearly followed in Ketel's footsteps by portraying these men on the brink of marching. Again, we can easily recognize the officers by their, by their traditional attributes. But what is striking here is that the painter suggested the group of guardsmen is much larger than those portrayed by painting just their heads and one or two eyes. Uh, especially in the middle of the group. There might even be a self-portrait included, as it would be most unusual to have someone paying for his portrait standing behind the non-paying drummer. Here's our drummer, the drum. This is the drummer. And behind him is this face. And if the drummer is a non-paying person, this cannot have been a paying person either. And he, to me, he looks very much like the... This the, the, the engraved portrait of Badens that we have. So there we go, another plausible identification. With this one by Jan Tengnagel, a few years after Badens and also in the show, the banquet is back on the pictorial repertoire as a leading motive, reminiscent of the group portrait we started with. Fortunately, the painting does not depict the start of an uprising against the authorities, but a reshuffle within the officers' ranks. The standard bearer approaching is offered the empty chair by the captain sitting there on the left. He himself is leaving the civic guard as he has been appointed burgomaster. So there's your action, your drama, added to the group portrait. The interaction between the men is indeed so lively that we hardly notice that most of the men do not appear to pay any attention to us. 
Well, the most monumental set of commissions for civic art paintings was, of course, given towards the end of the 1630s in Amsterdam, when a brand new hall was decorated with portraits of several companies of the Arquebusiers Civic Guard. The overall effect here in a digital reconstruction must have been spectacular. In this talk, I limit myself to the results achieved by Rembrandt in his Night Watch, completed in 1642. The famous painting, by far the artist's most ambitious portrait, has been praised many times for its dynamism and bustling energy. This is largely due to the narrative element Rembrandt elaborated on. Captain Franz Banningkok in the middle, whose open mouth indicates he is speaking, is depicted as the hub of a series of interlocking actions. According to his preserved private notes, he is ordering Lieutenant Willem van Ruitenburg, dressed in his very light costume, to set the group of civic guardsmen on the march. So the moment chosen by Rembrandt is that just before the regrouping of the squad. In a way, Rembrandt confronts us with a situation of what would, appear, what would happen after the moment depicted by Badens in the painting you just saw, men ready to come into action have indeed come into action. Rembrandt well, might well have borrowed the motive of the open space in the middle background from Badens, as well as the idea of suggesting more men present than those portrayed, not just by painting partial faces, but by leaving them out altogether. Because what's happening? Look at him here. It's our sergeant, Rombout Kemp. He's bringing over the captain's orders, pointing forward while looking behind him, hinting at the presence of more men beyond the limitations of the frame. The drummer emphasizes the start of the action, just like the Baden's drummer, while a dog shrinks back and begins barking. In the center, oh, I had some nice details here, sorry. Yeah. Uh, in the center of the painting, Ensign Jan Visser is raising the flag. He has not risen the flag, no, he's raising the flag, while others are taking long pike staffs from the stand. The musketeer on the left is loading his gun, while the boy carrying a horn of gunpowder breaks excitedly into a run. The captain and lieutenant themselves are moving forward and will shortly arrive at the best lit place in the middle foreground of the painting, an effect that will have had an even more uh, big, bigger impact when the painting still had its original dimensions. As the beholders of this highly impressive gathering, we feel privileged to be present at this eventful moment. So now let us shift our attention on group portraits of governors. Whereas the 17th century group portraits of the civic guard manifest an in undisputed civic pride, those painted for the charitable institutions seem to underline virtues such as good management and benevolence. In the 17th century, boards of governors formed the direction of all sorts of foundations meant for needy citizens, orphaned, sick, mad, or simply old, or combinations. And of course, there, was, there were working houses, prisons where beggars, thieves, whores, and other citizens, too difficult to handle, were put away and re-educated. To the male members of the city patricians, uh, an, honor, an honorary position as regent or governor formed a good preparation for their social and political <coughs> careers, comparable to a function as an officer in the civic guard. For their female counterparts, governorship was considered an appropriate spending of time. The group portrait in the governor's room on which their likenesses were preferably surrounded by needy children or old people formed the reaffirmation of their virtues, while subsequent generations of governors could derive their own legit legitimacy from it. When related to charitable and disciplinary institutions, the governors had themselves, usually, had themselves usually portrayed during a meeting, sitting around the table, as in this case with Van der Helst, governors of the Spinning House in Amsterdam. The exact occasion for ordering those portraits is not always known, as is also the case 
with many civic art pieces. In some cases, it might have been the renovation or building of the meeting room that needed proper decoration. But it's more likely the complete renewal of the council itself offered grounds for desiring a portrait. This habit led in many cases to a certain regularity, or let's call it a tradition if you want, in commissioning paintings once the institution had taken the first step. And the artist who set the standard was Cornelis van der Voort, an immigrant from Antwerp. After having establishing himself, uh, established himself as a successful painter of group portraits in Amsterdam, he introduced the composition um, of the group of governors around the table around 1616. And it would not change significantly for the next two centuries, probably because it enabled the painters to present the administrative capacities of the sitters so well. Also, the hierarchy within the group could be made clear. The longest serving governors are sitting at the front, the latest appointed are standing at the back, and there is a servant on the right. When we look at the narrative potential of portraits like these, then there is firstly the interaction between the men themselves. They are caught in the act of performing their responsible task, in this case as governors of the merged hospitals. The biblical painting in the back appropriately refers to healing. But that's not all the painter is suggesting. This meeting is briefly interrupted by us looking at the man in action. It is it is as if they will continue the moment after we will have left the room, or if you prefer, have shifted our attention to the next painting in the exhibition. It would be not surprising if Rembrandt based the leading motive of some of his early single portraits on what he could have studied in governor's rooms in town. Let us take this one again, the governor's room of the former Amsterdam Civic Orphanage, now the Amsterdam Museum, where I work, in order to discover another subtle way to add drama to the group portrayed. Preparing his first major commission in Amsterdam in the early 1630s, maybe thanks to Hendrik Eulenburg again, Jacob Bakker introduced a needy orphan child at the meeting table, causing a chain of reactions among the governing ladies. The inclusion of personnel and needy residents, all folk that was not able to pay for their own likenesses, so these extras were included in the price per governor, they provided the portrait painters a welcome opportunity to add narrative to the scene. It allowed them to depict their clients not just sitting and showing us their faces, but interacting both between themselves and with us. At the same time, as you can see here, their presence underlined the, the message uh, of the, the, the presence of those extras underlined the message of charity. These people can count on the good care of the board. And in this majestic painting by Dirk Sandford in the show, the two sitting female governors are checking the result of their personnel's responsibilities. The quality of the lace work produced by the inmates and the change given compared to the daily shopping list. Another one by Rembrandt. A subtle narrative element is also present in the syndics, which you might have seen at the Prado show last year. But this painting was probably inspired by um, a Haarlem painting from, by Johannes Versprong 20 years earlier. Under their artistic direction, Versprong, Rembrandt, the more or less accidental presence of the viewer in the meeting room and the subsequent interruption of the council meeting has become the main subject of the painting. While one of the syndics is still addressing the group, the others look in the direction of the unexpected visitor. One of them gets up, perhaps, to greet us. In addition, the, the addition of the element of time to this group portrait illustrates Rembrandt's genius as a portrait painter. By presenting his sitters in action, he constantly invites us to ask ourselves which moment of the action are we looking at, what was happening before, and what will happen next. Rembrandt's syndics does not represent the board of a charitable institution, but a group of men affiliated with a craft guild. Only the wealthiest of guilds could afford group portraits, like the wine merchants, or the gold and silversmith, as can be seen in the exhibition. 
But most commissions came from the Amsterdam Surgeons Guild. Between 1600 and 1760, they ordered about 15 group portraits, eight of which are anatomy lessons, uh, are anat have an anatomy lesson as the main motive. Because of the actions depicted, the museum visitor might be inclined to interpret these remarkable group portraits as depictions of events that really happened, even more than in the case of the Civic Guard paintings. And admitted, there's plenty of reason for this, as in most cases, there is archival proof an anatomy lesson took place on a particular moment. The painting can be considered the immortalization of the event, but that's about it. The anatomy lessons were organized by the guild on a regular basis and must have looked more like this. They were given by an ac academically trained doctor appointed by the local government. He not only performed anatomy lessons on dead bodies, subjecta anatomica, but also provided other forms of medical education. And usually each lesson would take more than a day and because of the well, decaying nature of the corpse, they were held in winter um, when temperatures were low. As you can see on this uh, blurry uh, <laughs> engraving, these lessons were not open to members of the guild only, but also to outsiders. And by the end of the 16th century, the yearly public disse dissections that were allowed to be given in Amsterdam had grown into social events, which attracted many spectators. It's also important to realize that surgeons who feature so prominently in the anatomy paintings were not doctors, but craftsmen. They were authorized to treat external complaints and carry out only minor operations, such as bloodletting in this painting in the exhibition or haircutting also in this same picture. Um, and finally, we have to realize that in painted anatomy lessons, the sitters had to pay for their own portraits, like in civic art paintings and governor's group portraits. This is why only a limited, limited number of surgeons is depicted. Most of these paintings, however, were produced not long after the appointment of a new prelector. So these group portraits commemorated the tenure of the prelector and for the surgeons depicted their membership of the Surgeons Guild. The famous anatomy lesson of Dr. Tulp that Rembrandt produced in 1632 marks Rembrandt's arrival in Amsterdam on a monumental scale. Rembrandt appears at first sight to be presenting us a realistic representation of an anatomy lesson as we actually see a prelector engaged in the process of dissection. The surgeons give all their attention to the demonstration and not so much to the fact that they are being portrayed as in earlier anatomy lessons. And since the public anatomy lesson is recorded in the archives in January 1632, the realistically rendered subjectum, the corpse, might very well have been based on Rembrandt's observations of an actual corpse. But the anatomy lesson of Dr. Tulp has less to do with the reality of the dissection than one, one might think at first sight. Good practice laid down that at the beginning of each dissection, the prelector should open the abdomen, describe and discuss the fast degenerating organs, and then remove them. In this case, an intact subjectum is shown, and the whole process appears instead to have started with a forearm. The choice for the dissection of the arm as opposed to the intact body could be interpreted as an homage to the great and influential anatomist Andreas Vesalius, who considered the arm to be the physician's chief instrument. And in the lower right of the painting is a book which may be seen as a reference to theoretical treatises against which the practice of anatomy must always be tested. Tulp is demonstrating the function of the fingers, both by pointing at the respective muscles in the arm and by repeating the gesture with the left hand. So there's a clear message in this scene. And that's not all. Contemporary accounts of orations and anatomy lessons tell us that the dissection itself was often pre preceded by a moralistic text in which it was explained that anatomy was a path towards knowledge of God. 
and in which the audience were encouraged to acknowledge their own mortality. It's a message or admonition of this kind that is probably contained in this painting. The prelector is explaining the divine nature of the creation and the divine presence in the human body. The degree to which Tulp's eloquence is getting through to his audience is reflected by the surgeon's moods, those portrayed. The successive stages of reaction to the prelector's arguments by the surgeons from silent contemplation to complete assimilation of the message heighten the drama of the scene. And to finish it off, the surgeon at the top of the human pyramid is pointing at the table below while looking at us, making sure the important message reaches the viewer as well. While speaking of narrative, narrative, drama, or meaning, this painting has it all. But now, of course, to the painting in our show. Another intact dead body is prompting the action on this one, the anatomy lesson of Frederick Gruis, painted by Adrian Bakker. Needless to say, both painter and prelector must have been familiar with Rembrandt's contributions to the subgenre of the anatomy lesson. When we consult the anatomy book of the Surgeon's Guild, which lists all anatomical lessons organized um, by the Guild, it becomes clear that Rouse's demonstration of the human anatomy took place in early spring, which was fairly new. Because of the perishable nature of dead flesh and other body parts, this preferably happens in the low temperatures of winter. But already by 1670, the year the painting was made, Ruys had an international reputation as an anatomist, thanks to his revolutionary injection techniques. He prepared limbs and organs with warm, fast solidifying liquids to which pigments were added for a lifelike effect. As a result, it became possible to hold anatomical demonstrations outside the winter months. An additional advantage was that the spectators were no longer faced with the growing stench of a corpse in a state of decomposition during the days the anatomy lesson lasted. Contemporaries praised Rouse for the aesthetic value he had provided the anatomy lesson with. It's obvious that modern scholars have tried to link the prelector's fame as an embalmer to his documented anatomy lessons for the Surgeon's Guild. Because of the fact that the recorded public anatomy lesson of 1670 was not in, held in winter but in spring, it is indeed tempting to assume that Rouse had prepared the corpse of a certain Pasquier Joris, a criminal executed on the 29th of March 1670, prior to his performance in the anatomy theater. However, precisely this is most unlikely, judging from the information in the anatomy book. The time available between the execution, execution of the poor criminal, 29th of March, and the first day of the demonstration, 30th of March, was simply too short. That the event was used by the prelector to demonstrate his injecting and embalming techniques is not likely either. On the basis of the information in the archives, it seems, probably, it seems probable that he presented a more conventional anatomy lesson, which in most cases took several days. An, ex an exact moment on which the depicted scene may have occurred during the documented anatomy lesson is impossible to determine. It can safely be ruled out that Rouse would have started his demonstration at the groin of his subjectum, as he does in the painting. So what are we looking at? Perhaps the most striking element on Bakker's painting is the almost integrate state of the subjectum anatomicum. Lying in a horizontal contrapposto on the dissecting table, the dead young man forms the focal point of the group of surgeons. The young prelector, third from left, holding the scalpel, demonstrates the location of the lymph glands in the groin, for which he has removed part of the skin of the lower abdomen and the left thigh. Might there be a deeper meaning in the composition and choice of the dissection? Well, rather than stressing the lifeless state of the subjectum anatomicum as Rembrandt did twice before him, Bucker, the painter, tried his utmost to avoid that effect, no doubt stimulated to do so by Rouse. The body on their dissecting table appears to belong to someone sleeping. 
an impression confirmed by the raised dried leg, unthinkable for a dead body. So clearly this is not the body of Pasquier Joris, but a model, that of a model, posing as a subjectum anatomicum. And although his idealized presence as a dead person, who seems to be just sleeping, is the main subject of the painting, the demonstration of the lymph glands in the groin is also of importance because it refers to the prelector, prelector's groundbreaking research in this field. And in the background, in order to underline the emphasis on the scientific character um, uh, of anatomy, Bakker decorated the imaginary room with the statues of Dr. Gallon of Pergamum, left, and the god of medicine, Asclepius, on the right. So yes, there is a deeper meaning. With this carefully orchestrated anatomy lesson, Reus must have wanted to endorse his acquired status as a respected physician, scientist, educator, and an excellent taxidermist of bodies. May I end the talk with this magnificent fragment? Even though it might be difficult to judge the amount of action depicted following the fire in 1723, which destroyed the largest part of the canvas. Ironically, the corpse lying on the table was among the few survivors of the disaster. And thanks to this, we can still enjoy one of the most successful examples of foreshortening in art history. A small drawing by Rembrandt made after the completion, well, no, in prepare, preparation of the painting, shows us the original composition, presenting a symmetrical arrangement of the anatomical action reminiscent of frontispieces in books of anatomy. So very symmetrical in a way. We have to bear in mind that in selecting a theme for this painting, Daimon had to surpass his predecessor Tulp, while Rembrandt had to find original solutions to the same problem, that of portraying a group of people around a dissecting table. The choice of a brain dissection there it is again. The choice of a brain dissection would allow the prelector not only to show off his anatomical skills, but also to focus attention to the most elevated part of the body, the human brain. Even from the surviving part of the canvas, it becomes clear that here as well, the narrative is very much present. The dissection is well underway, and among the Amsterdam anatomy lessons, only this one hints at the correct order in which, which the sections were performed, leading our eyes from the feet of the subjectum to the empty thorax. Rembrandt shows us that prior to what is taking place right now, the body has been opened and the various perishable organs have been removed, just like the handbooks prescribe. The assistant on the left has just taken off the black cloth covering the corpse after a lunch break, who, get, who, who knows, and has hung it over its arm. The skull cap rests in his hand while Daimon is now showing his audience the shape of the falx cherubri, located between the two parts of the human brain. Daimon's gesture can be explained as a reference to the age-old memento mori message, given the similarities in both form and name between this falx and the reaper's sickle, the symbol of death himself. Within moments, Dr. Diamond will reveal the very nucleus of the human brain, the part where it was thought at the time the human soul was housed. And originally, the beholders of the painting must have been given the feeling they were embraced, embraced by the wooden walls of the anatomy theater. There was no escape looking through the feet past the empty thorax and being the privileged witnesses to the important event just described, just like the surgeons present. Unfortunately, to conclude, we will never know the expressions on the faces of the people assembled, just as we will never know if Diamond was looking at them or us or concentrate on what he was doing. But presumably, the movements and gazes have been comparable to those in Rembrandt's other group portraits. Looking at these paintings helps us to consider how much the now missing surgeons must have contributed to the narrative present in the painting in its entire state. This reconstruction, based on the drawing, the fragment, and several single portraits, all by Rembrandt, might help us to consider the effect as intended by the artist. But in the end, 
you might prefer to stand face to face with this painting uh, fragment in the last room of the exhibition and undergo the strong visual impact that this moving fragment still managed to have. To end with a more cheerful image, I show you this rude reconstruction. Presuming Rembrandt must indeed have studied the Amsterdam group portraits quite well, not only to be inspired for famous groups of his own, but also preparing for his individual portraits. Thank you very much.